Dr. Atchison here, and this is our first lecture on sensation and perception. First, we're just going to talk about kind of the basics and overall sensation and perception, and then we'll get into the different senses and how um, perception is affected um, by the different kind of input. So let's get right down to basics, the definitions. Sensation is any of that physical stimulation. Um, so if you're being touched, that's that the actual touching is the sensation. That's the, the, the physical part of it. Um, it's the light that comes into your eyes. It's my voice going into your ears. Um, that is the sensation part of it. That's the actual physical stimulation. Perception, on the other hand, is that interpretation of that sensory information. And while the sensation may be the same, your perception of it may be different. Um, and so this is where really... Um, you know, the mental processes are going to come into effect in terms of thinking um, on, on how this works. So here's a little uh, graphic that kind of talks about that. Um, whether, again, doesn't matter what the sense is, doesn't matter if it's um, hearing or seeing or touch or taste or smell or any of the, the, the various other sensations, um, that input, that stimulation, um, going into your brain is that sensation part of the puzzle. Um, and then once your brain gets the information um, and it decides what to do with it, it organizes, it interprets it, it initiates a response, that's all happening in perception. Um, so sensation is, again, um, going to be the stuff that's in our world that um, can create um, this experience. And then our perception is going to be what we think that experience is, um, our interpretation of that. Now, the way that we've talked about this, we've talked about this um, in sensation happens first, and then our, our brain organizes it and interprets it. And that's one of the ways it can happen. Um, that's what's called bottom-up processing. Um, Bottom-up information is that idea that, again, that sensation is happening, and then we have our perception, which in turn affects our attention, memory, and our thinking and action. However, not all of our processing happens that way. We can have bottom-up processing, and a lot of times that's what happens. Um, but what we think, um, our memory, our attention, all of that can affect our sensation, our perception of that sensation. And that's what we call top-down processing, where our knowledge, our expectations, and our goals can affect that perception. So it's not... When you think something happened one way and it didn't, that's going to be top-down processing. So the other day I was having um, several technical difficulties on several different fronts um, and I was putting out all these different fires via email and text and phone call and all these different things. And my husband sends me a text and tells me that this hotel that we're trying to book is booked. Well, because I'm dealing with all of these other things that are going wrong, when he says this, I think, oh no, the hotel's booked and we can't stay there. Um, when in the case was, no, he had called it and, and reserved it for us. But because of top-down information, when I saw that, I interpreted it as something bad. I interpreted it as the negative version because I had all these other fires that I was putting out. So it was kind of waiting for the other shoe to drop. That's that top-down processing affected my perception um, of that incoming information. Top-down processing also explains illusions, whether they're optical illusions and auditory illusions. If you go to that supplementary folder on iCollege, there's a bunch of different illusions that aren't required but are just fun. Um, and you can see how um, our thinking and our memory and attention can really affect um, these different um, different processes are interpretation of different sensations. What you expect to see or what you're used to seeing um, really tricks you in some way or what you're expecting to hear, what you're used to hearing kind of tricks you in some way um, so that you are perceiving something different than it's really happening. Okay, so back to bottom-up processing. The basic steps in that um, are back to our friend, the neuron. Um, our sensory receptors are neurons, okay? Um, and they're specialized neurons that take that information in. They're going to detect stimulation. Um, and they're going to do that and convert this into this neural 
signal via a process that's called transduction. And what this does is it converts the incoming energy, whether it be light, whether it be sound, whether it be touch, um, again, taste, any of these things, it's converting that incoming information, that incoming stimuli into an electrochemical signal. Um, remember how we talked about the neuron um, and the synapse is just a circuit system, it's just an electrical circuit system. So for that circuit system to work, we have to have that electrochemical information. And so this is turning that on, it's converting that, that's what transduction is, is what's, we're taking light and turning it into a neuron signal. We're taking sound and turning it into a neuron signal. Um, and again, this allows for that neural communication. It allows for our sensory system, our peripheral nervous system, to talk to our, um, our central nervous system. So transduction is where that, that conversion is happening. And once that conversion happens, then that pathway we've talked about in terms of the peripheral nervous system up to the central nervous system can happen. Um, we can go from our neurons in say our fingers to our neurons in our sensory cortex via this electrochemical um, transmission of information, via this neural communication. Now, we have to, to be able to detect um, different information, we have what's called an absolute threshold. And the absolute threshold, again, this works for all of our senses, is the minimum amount of energy that's detectable. Um, and this depends on what kind of sense we're talking about. Um, it depends on different things. Um, but again, it's the minimum amount of stimulation that we have to be able to detect it. Sometimes you could have something touching you and you don't feel it. Um, you could, there's a sound that someone else hears and you don't hear it. It's not meeting your absolute threshold. Um, so you're not detecting that um, because there's not enough energy there. There's not enough stimulation there. Remember, neurons are all or none. Um, so if we don't have enough, if we don't get to all, then we're going to be at none. Um, and our definition for absolute threshold, our operational definition for that, is the level that's required for us to be able to detect that 50% of the time. So if you're in a really quiet space uh, and you have, you know, an old, either an old-fashioned clock or you have, um, you know, a refrigerator or something like this that's making a noise, um, if you can walk as far away from that thing um, as you can until you only hear it, you know, kind of about half of the time, not all the time, but you can kind of still hear it, but not all really and not always, you're right there at your absolute threshold. That level of energy coming in of that sound is at your absolute threshold where you're kind of hearing it and you're kind of not. If you hear it all the time, then you're above your absolute threshold. If you don't hear it at all, you're below your absolute threshold. Um, and we have some different detection thresholds, again, for different senses. So for light, we're really, really good at detecting light as humans. Um, you can detect, if it's a clear, dark night, you can detect a single candle flame at 30 miles. Um, so light detection is something that we're very, very good at. Um, sound, you can detect the tick of a watch under really quiet conditions at 20 feet. If you think about that, that's pretty far. Um, again, um, that's with without other sounds. Um, a teaspoon of sugar and two gallons of water um, is where that absolute threshold is for detection. Um, one drop of perfume di diffused into an entire three-room apartment. So you can see how if you've done like five sprays of a perfume, it's going to be really could be overpowering in a small space. Um, because again, we have such a detection for, for these smells. Touch, we're really sensitive to that. Um, a wing of a bee falling on your cheek from a distance of one centimeter. So we're talking about something very, very light falling not very far at all, um, and, and your cheek is going to be a very sensitive area because it's on your face. Um, so that wouldn't necessarily be the same as a different part of your body, um, but here on your face, um, you've got very sensitive receptors. The other thing that we talk about in terms of detection um, and these sensory thresholds is discrimination. And that's being able to tell the difference between two stimuli. So a difference threshold is the minimum amount of change that, that's in a stimulus that's detectable. So again, this is any stimulus. So the light's brighter. 
um, what's the minimum amount it has to change for you to be able to detect that it's actually brighter? Um, or can you not tell the difference? Um, sound. So you tell someone to turn the volume up. My daughter does this to me all the time. She's like, can you turn the volume up? And I turn the volume up once because I don't really want it any louder in the car. And she's like, I can't, it's not any different. You didn't turn it up. I hadn't hit that difference threshold for her. She couldn't tell that it was louder. Um, that just noticeable difference is the difference between two stimuli that can be detected 50% of the time. Again, this is going to be our operational definition for that just, dif um, that just noticeable difference, the difference between two stimuli that can be detected at least 50% of the time. And Weber's law says that the size of this difference that's needed for detecting this change is proportional to the size of the initial stimulus. So if your stimulus is really, really big, you're going to need a bigger change um, to be able to detect a difference. Where if your initial stimulus was really, really small um, or really, really quiet, say if we're talking about sound, you won't need to go up much to hear the difference. But if you're already blaring your speakers, one click on the, the power, the uh, volume button is not going to make a big difference. But if you're really, really low on the volume, if you're at, you know, a really, really low volume, that one click will make a difference. And this is Weber's law. That again, that initial stimulus, you're going to need, it's going to be a proportion of that to be able to detect the change. The exact percentages of that really differ based on the stimuli. Um, so based on what sense you're talking about and what stimuli you're talking about. Um, and, and it gets really, really technical, but this is an intro class, so we don't need to talk about that level of detail. Um, but again, it's just this idea that um, it depends on the proportion of that initial stimulus. So to, to talk about this just noticeable difference, how many squares do you see here? We have a gray background. Um, how many squares do you see? Most of you probably said two, right? Um, there's actually three squares. Um, but the issue is, um, is that third square is in the middle and it's not, hasn't hit our just noticeable difference yet that we can detect it against the gray background. Um, so how much would we have to adjust that um, middle one to make it noticeable? That's what we're talking about in terms of just noticeable difference. Um, how much would we have to change that so that we can tell that there is actually a third square that is different um, compared um, to that background? The other thing that we have going on as a kind of an overall for our sensory system is adaptation. And this is the idea that we get used to things, right? Um, we'll talk about, we've talked about this a little bit, you know, already that you um, can um, kind of habituate to something, you can get bored with something, but it's how, how quickly does this happen and in what ways does it happen? So it's again, this gradual decline in sensitivity for a prolonged stimulus. So if you, again, have your music on really, really loud, when you first turn it on really, really loud, it sounds really, really loud. But if you've had it on for an hour at that level, it doesn't sound that loud anymore. In fact, you may want to turn it up more. Um, um, so again, you get used to this. Um, we're not as sensitive to this. Um, so we have a reduced sensitivity in response to this constant stimulation. Um, and this can be, I talked about sound, but it can also be for light. Um, so, you know, kind of think about um, really, really bright lights. Not only does your eye adjust to the really, really bright lights, and so then your pupil might not let as much light in, but you also get used to it, or you don't. You go out on a bright day without your sunglasses. Um, you know, for the first 10 minutes, and that's plenty of time for your eyes to adjust, it seems really, really bright. But you know, if you've been out there for two hours, you've gotten used to it. Um, so you're going to be have reduced stimulation. And what's really nice about this is that if there then is a change, um, it helps us focus on those changes. It allows us to see when there is a change a lot easier because we've become, become adapted to the sensations around us. One of the ones that we're really, really good at this is smell. So if you walk into, you know, your house after, or your apartment or your dorm after you've been away for a while, it smells different than it does to you when you've been there for a long time. It allows you to detect changes um, in the environment. So when I walk into my house after being gone for a while, it smells different to me than it does right now while I'm recording this lecture because I've been in the house for a while. It doesn't smell any different. Now, if I were to start smelling something, I say I, I don't smell anything right now. 
But if for say I was to smart start smelling something, it would be because I, there's a change in the environment and I can detect that because I've become adapted to the senses around me. I've become adapted to the smells around me. This can also be used with emotions as well. We become adapted to emotions so that we can detect changes in them um, really, really quickly. And we'll talk about this a little bit more when we get to the emotion chapter, um, that really, you know, detecting emotions is really, really important for our survival. And so becoming adapted to them so we can detect these changes quicker um, is really beneficial for us. Okay, so top-down processing. Um, again, top-down processing explains optical illusions. Um, there's a video that I want you to watch. Um, it's linked both in iCollege. Um, you can click on the link in the lecture outline. Um, it's on the YouTube playlist, however you choose to do it. It's fine with me. Um, but it explains how what we expect to see or what we're used to see um, can trick our brains into perceiving things differently than they actually appear. So really watch that video. It does a good job of explaining um, and giving you visuals on how that top-down processing really affects um, our visual um, system in this case. Um, what's also interesting though is, you know, these, these illusions are always kind of fun to watch. Um, these kind of like tricking you like, oh my gosh. Um, so they can be pretty enjoyable as well. The other thing that's important to think about in terms of top-down processing is context of, um, effects. So the context of something really, really matters. What you're used to really, really matters. Um, some of this stuff is innate. Um, some of it is what we expect and some of it's learned. So if you grew up in a really, really hot environment, um, cold, when you, you might get cold easier than someone who grew up in a very, very cold environment. And um, that context makes a difference. What you've learned um, about um, temperature around you, it will affect your thermoreceptors. Um, my parents are both, both from the north. My mom is from Chicago and my dad is from South Dakota. Um, and so they call me a weather wimp. I was born in Houston. Um, I grew up in Texas. Um, Atlanta is probably the coldest place I've ever lived, which is really sad. <laughs> Um, so I can get cold really, really easily um, because of what I've learned um, and what I expect in terms of thermoreceptors. Um, they also are fed by um, our sensation and our cognition and emotion that we talked about in terms of top-down processing. And again, culture is playing a role. So the, bio, uh, the biosocial psychological event um, context is really helps us see this framework. Um, so again, we have bio biology at play here, our sensory information, um, things that we don't have access, we haven't learned. Um, and then there's a critical period for sensory development as well and um, that we really won't talk about much in this class. But say if you don't get vision input at a certain time, your eyes don't develop correctly. If you don't hear, if you don't get auditory information at a certain time point, you don't hear correctly. That's why cochlear implants work so much better um, on infants and small children than they do on adults um, because of that critical period for sensory development. So there is this biology that's at play here in our perception, in our sensation. Our psychological influences, we'll talk about some of these more, um, our gestalts, um, we'll talk about that one in our vision chapter. Um, what we've learned about the world around it, what we've learned about the schemas, again, these context effects, what we're used to, what we expect, um, and that affects our, that's our perceptual set as well. And then our social cultural influences, what our cultural in assumptions tell us, what our cultural expectations tell us. Um, so think about taste, right? Different cultures have very, very different taste profiles. Um, and we start to learn those very, very early. In fact, infants start to learn those before they're even born um, because the flavors of their world, of what their mother is consuming, is being transferred into that amniotic fluid. And so they're learning these cultural expectations on taste very, very early. So if, you're, you, if you grew up eating spicy food, then spicy food doesn't hurt your mouth. If you grew up eating bland food, then it does. Um, it can. So again, we have these different influences, these different cultural influences. And in terms of social culture, the easiest one to think of um, is taste um, and, and smells too, because again, different flavors um, have different smells when they're cooking. Different kinds of foods have different smells when they're cooking. Um, and so you'll, it's something that smells different to you may not smell different 
different or unpleasant to someone else because they have these different social cultural influences. Okay, so that ends our kind of broad overview of sensation and perception. Um, we're going to start talking about the various different sensations we have. And the first one we're going to talk about in the next lecture is vision. Thanks.